What's up, everybody? Welcome to Venture Church Online. My name's Patrick. I'm Chris. And we are super excited to be here with you today because today is an exciting day. It is Today, Patrick, is Venture Church's seventh birthday. Seventh birthday. Happy Seven. birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Woo. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Seven years. That's a long time. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last seven years. Yeah, think about how many Marvel movies have come out in the last seven years. Most of the good ones. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of movies. A lot of the good ones. Uh, think about how many times you have gone and eaten donuts somewhere. Oh man, uh, that's just too many to name. Seven, seven years, years worth of donuts. What if you had that all at once? <laughs> that think would about, be a party. Think about how many times you watch a political advertisement on TV that you wish wasn't on TV. Oh, that was not seven years. That, that, that was just this week. That was just this week. Yeah. It just felt like seven Guys, years. Guys, it's seven years. We're over at the YMCA in person right now celebrating. And so, I don't know, you might have time to swing over there and get to the Y. We probably started a little bit later than this online stream. Uh, but we wanted you to be able to celebrate with us. And so, one big thing we're doing to celebrate our seventh year is a brand new Venture Church t-shirt. Yes, and yeah. it's super cool. Check out this shirt. Isn't that thing cool? It says shine light in dark places. It's got the wave on it. It's looking cool. Uh, so if you want one of those, we've got them available through our website. You actually go to the resources link and then click on events. It's actually under events. That's how you can get them. They're 10 bucks. Uh, yeah. That's a steal. And get and one well for your whole family. It. We've got some other really cool events and items of interest that will be coming out to you in the very near future. Yeah. So keep your ear to the ground and on our Facebook page to know when those are happening and what's going on with those. But for right now, let's ask a very important question. It's all too important the best question. Venture Kids, <laughs> where you at? Yeah. Let's kick it over for a Venture Kids moment. Hey, Venture Kids. How has your week been? Oh. I know you guys are back to school and whatever that may look like for you, it's probably not normal. And I've actually been hearing a lot of that word lately, just is this the new normal or when will we go back to normal and it's had me just thinking a lot about normal and how that kind of comes and goes and it even changes over time what our normal looks like and so if our hope is based in whether our life is normal at the moment that can be kind of a bummer when things aren't normal our hope has to be based in something more powerful than whether our daily life is normal or not. So I wanted to share with you guys one of my favorite verses. It's in Hebrews and they are talking about the promises of God and verse 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So I kind of feel like my life is a boat tossed in the stormy seas of 2020 and if there's anything that you want when you're in a boat in the middle of a stormy sea it's probably an anchor to hold you firm and steady and so i think a lot of the times when we use the word hope it's more like wishing like i hope i get to go to disneyland i hope i pass this test but the hope that we read about in the bible hope that is connected to Jesus is not wishing at all. It's an expectancy. It is a trust and a confidence in the promises of God. That is our anchor. And so what are some of the things that God promises us? I wrote down a few, but the Bible is full of his promises. He promises that we will have eternal life if we believe in him and that if we ask him, he will forgive us and set us free. God promises that he is with us and his peace will guard our hearts and minds. He promises to fight for us and to work all things together for good and for his glory. He promises to meet all of our needs and he promises that his love never ends. And that is better than any normal, new or old. And so I just wanted to encourage you guys that whatever you're facing right now, whatever your stormy seas may be, Jesus is our anchor. He is the hope that holds us fast. And I pray that you will let that fill you this week and then overflow into the people around you because our world desperately needs hope right now, guys. And in Romans 15, 13, there is a prayer. I pray that God, the source of hope, 
will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I'm praying for you guys and for all of us this week, that we would not only be filled with hope, but then overflow to all those around us. Now, before I let you go, I know you're wondering what I'm wondering. What is going on, boys? What's up with the balloons? It's oh my goodness, what is this? Do you know what's today? I don't, I, I don't know, it's Sunday. What's today? It's Venture Church's seventh birthday. Happy birthday, Venture Church! Seven years! Happy birthday, Venture Church! Good morning, I'm Stephanie. I'm a volunteer worship leader here at Venture Church, and Kaylee and I are really excited to worship with you this morning. So however you're connecting with us today, we just invite you to join in and make a joyful noise. Let's worship.
please continue and um, worship in this next song.
thank you for worshiping with us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this wonderful time of fellowship and celebration. Um, we thank you for this time of worship. Um, and we just want to just thank you for all the amazing things you've done um, through this church for you. God, I pray that today not be about us, but fully about you. In your name I pray. Amen. Venture Church, happy birthday, seven years. I could not be more pumped to be hanging out with you guys right now to talk about our seventh birthday. It's awesome. And uh, man, I, I remember it like it was yesterday, uh, being with my family in the U-Haul truck back in 2012, as I'm driving over one of the downtown bridges and seeing the skyline of Wilmington. We were moving to Wilmington to start Venture Church. And I remember driving across that bridge going, Wow, look at all those people. Look at that city. What am I doing? <laughs> Have I lost my mind? I don't know how to start a church. Like, who even wants to be part of this thing with me? Uh, God, has, God has certainly uh, had a good sense of humor uh, putting me in this kind of work. And I, I got to tell you, I have loved every minute of it. It's funny because driving here, I didn't even know how to get to my own house that day. Like I was used 100% relying on the GPS on my like iPhone 4 or whatever. And I remember like getting through town, like, oh, left, left, left. We landed here and it's honestly been a little bit like a blind date. You know, you show up and you don't really know what you're getting into, but it's one that has turned out fantastic. I wouldn't trade the last seven, eight, nine years of my life for anything. My family's been involved in this thing for nine years, and it's been seven years since we launched public services at the YMCA uh, as a group together. Uh, and Venture Church, we have been through so much together. I'd like to open up this morning by just kind of reminiscing, if we can, a little trip down memory lane. Uh, I'm remembering back when we were eight or 10 people meeting in a living room, and we were just dreaming about what it might look like to start a new church in Wilmington, specifically a church focused on reaching people who did not like church. What a crazy idea. Uh, but man, it's been so awesome to see people connect with God who were far from God and people build family with his church that at one point in their life might've thought, I will never, ever go to church. And now, I mean, we're family. It, it is so cool to see what God has done. Once we finally launched into our weekly services at the YMCA uh, seven years ago, things really took off. And, um, and there, were, there were countless stories to learn. First of all, we were mobile church. Uh, we still are today, as in we don't have our own permanent facility. And there was a lot to learn. How many of you guys remember when we used to have to climb up on the roof of the YMCA every single week to cover up the skylights in the gym so that we could use the projectors and see them good? How many people remember that? Don't raise your hand unless you're one of the four or five people who did it, because a lot of people didn't even realize there were some heroes. I'm talking to you, Jack Sledge and Dylan Oney. Neither of them live in Wilmington anymore, but they've graduated from their, their respective schools and moved on. But man, uh, those two guys and a handful of others who got up there, rain or snow and ice for real, and covered up those skylights so we could see the lyrics to our songs and read the scriptures on the projector. Uh, it's so cool. More of you remember this, though, the, the trailers. Okay, uh, there was a time when we had to load in and out of trailers every single week. Now we still have a little bit of that now. Now we've got the storage container at the Y, but man, uh, those trailers and to get to do that. But one of my weirdest memories of trailers was one morning, uh, we showed up at the YMCA early, early, like seven o'clock. And we went to our trailer to hook it up to the truck we were gonna pull it with that day. And the YMCA's school bus was parked in front of the trailer, right in front of the tongue so that we couldn't like, pull the truck up. And also the, the back of the trailer with the little door was backed all the way up against the fence on the adjacent property. So that it would only open like this much. And so it was like, we're stuck. What do we do? Everything we need for church is in that trailer and we can't get it out. So uh, we were able to pry the door open a little bit. Uh, somebody had to climb in there and then we passed every single thing that our church owned, which those of you who loaded in and out with us back in those days know there was a lot of heavy stuff. Each square stage pieces, you remember the square stage pieces? Those things were dangerous. I'm so glad we don't have those anymore. But we had those things and we had to pass them out through. And then we got, we unloaded our road cases until the trailer was light enough that we could slide everything to the rear of the trailer. And then a few of us got out and we, we, we grabbed the tongue, and tongue of the trailer and pivoted it out so that we could hook a truck up to it. 
Yes, yeah, science. Uh, man, we got that trailer out. And, uh, and guess what? Church started on time that day. We were able to really hustle and get that thing done. Oh, man, so many good stories. Not long after that was the fire. Uh, it was February, and uh, we were just a little bit more than a year old. I think it was around 2 a.m. I started getting text messages from people uh, in the community and friends saying, hey, the YMCA is on fire. I thought you should know. Uh, I didn't see those texts at 2 a.m. I didn't wake up till like 5.30 that morning. It was Sunday morning, and I woke up like, what's going on? Got on the phone with the director at the Y, and it was funny. She even said, you know, we're not 100% sure of the extent of the damage. Maybe you can still use part of the building this morning. Mm -mm, we didn't. When we finally got there around seven, uh, there were fire trucks and they were still hosing stuff down and there was a guy standing at the door like, none shall pass. And so, uh, but it was cool because a group of volunteers, we gathered in the parking lot. We're like, what do we do? We decided we were going to go to MP Park that day. And luckily everything we owned was out in one of our trailers and uh, we pulled our chairs out to MP Park and we made a billion phone calls and texts and shot out an email. And you know, like over a hundred people showed up at MP Park that day. And I will never forget the message that got laid on my heart that morning. I mean, I had another sermon completely written and ready to go. I don't think I ever preached that thing. I just whoosh, you throw it out the window because like you know, when the building burns down, you gotta, <laughs> gotta call an audible. And so I got a new sermon in my heart and I will never forget the message that day was that we are the church, the devil is real, but our God is greater. We really grew up as a church family that day. We galvanized as a people and we realized that church was really not about a building. And it wasn't about a Sunday morning gathering. It was about a group of people unified around our Lord and Savior Jesus. And uh, we really learned a lot. The next week we learned even more because God opened up the avenue for us to be in Alderman Elementary School. I'm still blown away by the series of events that allowed us to be there. And Alderman Elementary School became our home, honestly, for the majority of our young church life. We've, we, we've been there as a venue longer than anywhere else. And so many of you jumped on uh, your journey with our church family at that point. And so many great stories happening there. One of my favorite all-time stories of all church ever was at Alderman Elementary School. And so uh, if you served with us as a volunteer before, you know, you get there early and we set up and then around nine, we stop everything and we do our backstage service, which is just our volunteer service. And we sing a couple songs and we look at God's word. We share communion together. It's a beautiful time in itself. But this particular day, we were in the lobby at Alderman Elementary School and we could see out the glass windows of the front of the school, if you can remember that, those of you who were there and uh, it began to snow behind us and it was so cool and so we, we I remember Aaron leading us in a song and I still have video of our little volunteer crew that morning singing and you could see the snow through the big windows and it was just so peaceful and we were celebrating who God is and then after that we all went outside from the oldest to the youngest and we just played in the snow man it was a snowball fight we built these little tiny snowmen and as some of the youngest kids that's like the first time they'd ever seen snow it was so cool because we live in Wilmington like what's snow we don't, we don't have that here heard about snow is it real? I heard it was a myth. So cool. I love looking back at the pictures from that day, and I'm glad we took pictures. Uh, unfortunately, our time at Alderman kind of uh, ended somewhat abruptly. Uh, we found out four weeks before our contract with the school system ended that we weren't going to be able to renew that summer. This was 2017 now. And uh, so we kind of went on the hunt for a new venue. We uh, were so blessed by our friends at First Baptist Church. They let us use their, their gymnasium annex, which happened to be right across the street from Alderman. They, they had seven weeks available. So we took them up on that. And during that seven weeks, you might remember every single week when you came to church, me or somebody got on stage and we're like, hey, just so you know, we're still not sure where we're going to have the church service next week. Uh, so come back here if you don't. And uh, I remember saying, hey, this is the church where if you can find us, you can worship with us. That's how you can go to church adventure. Um, and so we toured and looked at and called over 40 venues in Wilmington. That particular summer, if you were a church trying to open up somewhere, you weren't finding a place. None of those places were available. Either they were too expensive or they weren't you know, ideal. We couldn't do what we want to do there or weren't available, whatever. But I think God had a plan in all of that. Because just as our seven weeks at the annex, the First Baptist gym, like came to an end, like I think, I think with 10 days lead, we got a call from the AMC movie theater. And a lot of you joined your journey with Venture there at the AMC movie theater. We, ha we have a lot of memories there, a lot of good things like, man, we ordained our first group of elders there. I've been so thankful for James and George and William and Brandon and the spiritual insight and leadership they've added to our church family. But I gotta be honest, our time in the movie theater for me is just kind of a blur. Uh, it really is uh, because like we were there for about a year and then something else happened. 
It was on the Sunday that we were going to celebrate our fifth birthday, only two years ago. We were so pumped about it. And guess who showed up uninvited? Hurricane Florence. That's right. She just rolled into town and ruined everybody's day. Uh, we weren't able to have Sunday services there for three weeks. We were able to go some other places. But during that time period, our church family was involved in something pretty spectacular. We co-founded Disaster Assistance Relief Teams of Wilmington, DART ILM, uh, to do relief work in the area. In fact, DART ILM was able to put hundreds of volunteers to work in I think three or maybe four counties where we ended up eventually landing mostly in Burgall in an area called White Stocking. We helped rebuild some homes there. DART ILM grew up and she's gone off and she's her own nonprofit today, registered as a 501c3 with the federal government and uh, still serves serving the citizens up there through some of that work. It's amazing to see what God did through that. And, and it was 2019, January, when we finally were able to answer a call we got from the Y. After four years of rebuilding, the YMCA called us back uh, and said, hey, you want to come back and start services at the YMCA again? 2019 was a great year. We really enjoyed some growth there. We enjoyed meeting some new friends. Some of you watching today might have been part of that group, but none of us were prepared for this. Here we are, worldwide pandemic, 2020 craziness. Whew. Venture Church, we have been through a lot together, celebrating seven years. That little trip down memory lane was a lot of fun, uh, but it says nothing about the mission that we exist for. We don't exist to just put on a Sunday morning service, guys. That's not what this is about, even though that's kind of what the thread of that whole story was. No, we exist, we've been saying it since day one, to shine light in dark places by being God-chasing, grace-shaped love agents. And so in the last seven years, we've also seen some amazing spiritual things. Over 53 people have given their life to Jesus in Christian baptism, and we've seen that. We've partnered with some of the greatest kingdom-minded ministries in our city to shine light. I think about groups like Nourish NC and Vigilant Hope. We've partnered with the Wilmington Ministerial Association. That's the group that puts on the Back to School Bash that gives away uh, all the book bags and school supplies to kids in need every year. We've been able to shine a light at the UNCW campus through campus ministry like Campus Christian Fellowship and Crew and Ratio Christi. Uh, we've partnered with, I just, I can't even think of how many church families in the city we've partnered with to do other things. I think about Cape Fear Christian Church and Greater Wilmington Church and Pine Valley Church of Christ and Purpose Church and New Beginnings, uh, The Bridge and Restoration Church, Impact Church, where I'm filming this right now, Life Point Church. The list is just too long. I can't, I can't say anymore, but man, the kingdom partners we've had in this city to just stand on the front lines and say, we are here to shine the light of Jesus. Does anybody remember Love Agent Week? Love Agent Week is something that we've done uh, that's helped to live out that mission of shining light in dark places. To emphasize our commitment to being love agents, we set aside a week every year uh, to just do some different act of service every day. Now we took a break from that for a couple of years, but guess what? We're going to bring it back. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to have a new love agent week, and we're going to try to restore that love uh, of seeking God through uh, service and loving. And so stay tuned as we talk more and more about that. We have been through a lot together. And through it all, we've learned that God and his kingdom are alive and well. And there's a lesson in that for us. Uh, that's why today, as we celebrate seven years together, I want to issue a challenge to us in the form of a new sermon series that we're starting out today. And uh, this is kind of just an introduction to the idea. We're going to be studying it for several weeks to come now. Uh, but the series is called, you ready for this? I love the title of this series. It's called Pandemic Hope Spike the Curve. Wow, should get onto your skin. Pandemic Hope. Because uh, you know what I'm sick of? I'm sick of bad news. Are you sick of it? Enough bad news. I mean, you can't turn on the TV. You turn it on, the news is on, bad news. You turn on the radio, bad news. Social media, probably some bad news. Or you get an email or a text from a friend, they're probably telling you some bad news. Can't talk to your neighbor or your mama without getting some bad news. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. It's exhausting. It's infectious. And since 2020 has made us all doctors, we're all medical experts now, right? We learned all about infectious diseases and viruses. And uh, let's talk about viruses some this morning. 
Because I believe there's something we can learn about viruses that will translate into this idea of pandemic hope. Here's what a virus is. This is a boiled down definition. A virus is an infective agent that is able to multiply only within the living cells of a host. These are microscopic parasites. They're, they're, they're incapable of multiplying unless they invade a living creature and take over its cells. Uh, and we know a lot about viruses. We've learned a lot about viruses. We've been well-educated. We learned that viruses, uh, they can't travel more than how far? Six feet, apparently. I guess you get the ruler out. You like, can't go any farther than that. Uh, there's also something we know that viruses are, they are afraid of face masks. They have face, face maskophobia. That's a reality. They also are allergic to hand sanitizer. And so that's why that's a, I'm, I don't, I'm joking. That's, I don't know, I don't know that much about viruses. We all think we know a lot about viruses, but apparently this one is novel. And so we're trying to figure out how it works. But what I do know about this virus is it has held us captive for months on end. A teeny tiny little organism. Talk about bad news. And I don't know how history is going to measure this whole season of our life. Uh, but here's the deal. I'm actually not talking about COVID-19 today. Because I don't know that that's the virus that's been most infectious in the world. I'm talking about another virus that's plagued humanity for even longer. And it's a virus that I'm just going to call negativity. And then negativity paired with evil, uh, sin, it's a recipe for destruction. And it's something that the evil one and the forces of evil in this world have, have used to hold us captive for generations. The smallest, tiniest most minuscule speck of negativity can ruin your day. A mean comment, uh, it, it, the cut of an eye, or some bad news can just wreck your day. For months, we've been waiting on a vaccine or some sort of medical solution to COVID-19, maybe a miracle drug, maybe just a, something that someone comes up with like, yes, let's try that. And, and we're hoping for that because we believe that that will kind of put an end to that. You know, us as modern people, I'm not sure that we can really appreciate life before vaccines. Okay, so like, I know there's like, there's a whole thing about vaccines. Some of you aren't for vaccines. Some of you, I know some bad press about vaccines. If we can just remove that from your mind for a minute, okay? And I want you to place yourself in a world before the polio vaccine. I just recently uh, listened to a great podcast on the history of the polio vaccine. Very, uh, very educated. I was like, wow, I didn't know a lot of these things. I don't know how much you know about polio. I had a, had a, a terrible nickname. It was basically the infant paralysis virus. Uh, it called infant, caused infantile paralysis. And so the people that were mostly affected by the polio virus were small children and they would lose the ability to walk or the ability to lose, use their hands. And, and the other treatments that were available were uncomfortable and painful. There was this big iron lung you had to lay in with all kinds of like uh, pressure. And stuff. It, was, it was terrible. And, and the people of America and people around the world, it was spreading so quickly and it was just like, ah, there was a hopelessness involved in it. This podcast, though, told a really awesome story about the day that the polio virus vaccine was announced to the world. I believe it was in 1955. And they said that the, the climate, as you go back and look at newspaper clippings and news reports about what happened, the climate in America, when that vaccine hit, it said that people ran out in the streets and they celebrated and people threw parties and church bells were ringing all over the place because finally there's something that can be done about this terrible virus. The thing that had been holding them captive was no longer lording over them and they had something else now. Here's the deal. The polio virus wouldn't be completely eradicated until 1994. At least that's the date that we put on it. It'd be decades before it was completely gone. But the people living under the threat of the virus finally had something they'd never had before. They had hope. They had hope for their children. They had hope for their grandchildren. They had hope for generations to come. It brought hope. And so here's what I'm here to say today. And I want to encourage you and challenge you in this as much as well. Enough bad news. Let's start spiking the curve of hope. Because I think that hope is the antidote. It's the vaccine. It's the solution to the negativity, to the evil, and to the sin in this world that has plagued us and has been so infectious and that we can bring a cure. Um, today's just an intro to that idea. But what would it look like in your own life if you started focusing on the hope that God offers instead of the negativity of this world. 
I believe it would change everything. I, I believe that it would get inside of you like a vaccine. It would be an antidote antidote to the evil in, in your life. In fact, I believe it would grow inside of you, that it would change you, that it would transform you because that's the promise that God gives us through Jesus. And I know from experience that it will be contagious and will begin to spread, you know, social distancing and masks and hand washing. I'm not an infectious disease specialist. I've read blogs like you have. We're told that those things will flatten the curve of this current virus and let's fine, that's great. Let's leave that to the medical experts and let's do our part. But when it comes to hope, I believe that Jesus has challenged us to spike the curve and to do everything we can to spread that. And it starts with understanding that it's enough bad news. Let's start spreading the good news, the gospel, what Jesus is all about. Are you ready for some good news? Seriously, are you ready for some good news? We're going to be looking at some really good news today. If you got a Bible, go ahead and grab it. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 today. We're going to read most of the chapter of Romans chapter 8. So go ahead and uh, look ahead. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul, who's a guy who knew a lot about suffering and a lot about hope. Okay, and it's written to the church in Rome at the time, but we get the benefit of reading it today. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. And our challenge is to read this chapter and find the hope that God offers through Jesus. Let's just start at the very beginning. Here we are. Romans 8, verse 1. Here we go. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let that sink in. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. We're going to jump into this dichotomy discussion about uh, the spirit and the flesh and how they affect us. The message of Jesus, the message of salvation, of God's grace is that no matter your background, no matter your baggage, God loves you and he's made a path into his presence for you through his son Jesus. Uh, and, And as we get down to verse five, we're going to learn that there's pain in this messed up world but there's a solution to that pain. And the the pain in this world is caused by our human nature, by physical stuff. But the solution to that is for us to focus instead on spiritual things, particularly heavenly spiritual things. So if that sounds familiar, we're gonna look in verse five. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the spirit live according with the spirit. And they have their mind set on what the spirit desires desires. What does that look like? Well, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile towards God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. If you want to please God, you got to understand, we got to start leaning towards the spiritual thing. God's Holy Spirit in our life. We're going to get to that in just a second. A few weeks ago, I gave us a challenge. Uh, if you were at the YMCA with us in person at our church outside on August 23rd, I, and, and I did the same message online, we basically talked about this challenge of seek God's face, seek God's community, and shine light in dark places. And I got to tell you, like, I took that challenge to heart. I shared transparently with you uh, that day that, you know, in the last several months, I had found myself... Um, not focusing on seeking God's face. And I hadn't been in God's word like I should have been. I hadn't been praying like I should. And so that very next day, I took the same challenge that I gave to you guys. And I said, I'm gonna do this thing. I started a new habit. I started some journaling. Haven't done that in years. And I really needed to get my mind refocused on being governed by the spirit. And so this, is, this might be helpful to you. This is something that, that I did that maybe you could be help, uh, helped by. So I got a little journal and a little, some, little notebook and I, I do three, thing, three things every day. I try to do these three things every day. The first thing I do is I write down, it's just like a mind dump. Like I just, whatever I'm thinking about, I put it down on paper. So sometimes it's a prayer. Sometimes I'm just reflecting on yesterday, like dear diary, yesterday we went to the store. And sometimes I'm reflecting on what I have ahead of me for that day or for that week. It's, there's no rules. I don't put any rules around that. It's just for me to clear my mind. So I write down a paragraph or two about what's happening or what I'm thinking. The second thing I do is I seek God's word. And so I go to the Bible. Now you could do this anywhere in the Bible. I chose this time to start in the Psalms. And so I hadn't studied the Psalms in a long time. So every day I try to read at least one. Sometimes I've read two Psalms, especially if they seem to kind of go together. And I just read them. I read them and I meditate on them. There's something I learned recently called praying the Psalms. And basically you read the Psalms as if it's your own heart crying out to God. And you're just like, how can I turn this into a prayer? And so that's been an interesting, what I'm finding and it's it's amazing is that David who wrote most of these Psalms uh, and especially in the first half or two thirds of the book of Psalms, like this guy was in a bad spot. He was familiar with suffering and over and over he starts the Psalms like, 
How long will you ignore me, God? (laughs) I'm pressed on every side by my enemies. Will you destroy my enemies? I'm being chased by my foes. You know, all these things. This is a guy familiar with suffering. And I found that it's interesting to compare it to the world that we're living in today. But at the end of every psalm, it's amazing that the author always comes back to hope. And he says something like, but Lord, you are my strength. You are my refuge. You are my shield. And he returns to hope, even in the pit of his despair. So I I, I normally read this uh, psalm, and then I write down something about it. It, There's no rules to this thing. Sometimes I will just rewrite part of the psalm. Uh, Sometimes I will rewrite it in my own words. That's fun, kind of do my own little poetry thing. Uh, Sometimes I will uh, just write my thoughts about it. And then the third thing I do is I, I pray, okay? And so the way I'm praying mostly right now, sometimes I'll write out like a long prayer, but the majority of times I'm just writing down someone's name, a list of names, a lot of your names, actually. I pray for you as often as I can think of it. And, and next to that name, I'll write down the thing that I'm praying for about them. A word, a sentence, a little paragraph. Um, maybe I'll pray about situations and, and, and other things as well. But that's it. Now, I want to tell you, why did I tell you that story? Because I want to live a life where my mind is governed by the Spirit. And the only way to do that is to seek God's face with my own life. And it has made a difference. It has made a huge difference in my life. Now, those of you who know me very well will already know that I'm generally a pretty optimistic person. Uh, that's a discipline that I've worked on for years and years. I've tried to be optimistic, find the silver lining of things, whatever, whatever. But even as an optimistic person, I have found a notable change in my whole heart in general as I begin to seek God's face and try to be led by the Spirit, governed by the Spirit. And so I, I've barely, I think I've missed two days in, in the last month. Uh, and that's been my goal, so to do my best to do this every day to seek God's face. Now, I don't say that uh, as someone who's got it perfectly figured out. I don't. But I say that as an encouragement. Because I believe as we do this, that hope will start to get inside of us and it'll begin to grow, spike inside of us, and then it'll become contagious to those around us. Let's keep reading. Okay, Romans chapter eight, now we're at verse 18. Paul says, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. So much in that sentence. First of all, again, he's saying suffering's not new. Okay, so Paul had suffering. David had suffering. We're having suffering. Join the club. Plenty of suffering to go around. But it's not worth comparing to the glory that's ahead. That's hope. Hope is about looking forward. He goes on to talk about how evil and sin have actually affected creation. You know, when creation first came into existence, it was perfect. It was the Garden of Eden. And, and uh, the way I understand it is that a lot of the, you know, the dog eat dog, survival of the fittest, everything dying out there in nature and, and going into a state of chaos. Like, that's not what perfection and creation was like at the beginning. So even creation is like, oh my goodness, negativity, evil, and sin. They are destroying our perfect order of things. And they long for the days when God will restore that creation. And God says, I will restore that creation. Now, I don't know when that's going to be. He talks about it over and over, basically telling us that like, it's not for you to know, but I'm going to take care of it. And that's why I think verse uh, 24 is so powerful as he talks about the hope. It says, for in this hope, we are saved knowing that in the future God is going to restore all things. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? You follow that? Like hope is about something that's in the future, something that you don't have yet. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Optimism is nice, okay? Uh, Finding the silver lining, being able to spin something to the good side, like that's, that's nice. But you know what's even better than optimism? True hope. Hope. Hope is built on some previous knowledge. Okay, so for example, like the sun rises every day and it sets every day and it rises and it sets. And in my life, I've experienced that for 38 years. I've watched the sun rise and I've watched it set. And so when I get into the darkness of night, a long night, like one of those nights where I just can't sleep or it seems like it's never going to end, like the hurricane that hit a few weeks ago and like stuff slamming at my house and I got like branches and pine cones, like bowling balls falling on my roof. And I remember feeling like this night is never going to end. But you know what? There was never a moment There was never a moment when I was like, what if the sun doesn't rise? No, like, because the sun has a really good track record. Like it rises every single day for my entire life. The sun has always risen and it's always set and it's going to keep on going. So like I had some faith in the fact that the sun was going to rise. And so it led to hope knowing that eventually the storm will be over. 
And eventually I can get back to life. And there might be some damage to clean up in the aftermath, but I know the sun's going to rise. And so that's just an anecdotal example. It's a metaphor to help us understand that's how hope in God works. It crushes uh, the, the, the virus of negativity and evil because we can always look at God's track record. He's always been for us and not against us. He's never left us or forsaken us. He's always come through for us. So even in the midst of brokenness, even in the midst of fear, even in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, we can go, the sun will rise eventually. And I can find hope on that. Hope is based in faith. Faith is based on a track record. And God's track record is impeccable. When we get to verse 26, we see this. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Like in the middle of that darkness, whether it's my night in the hurricane or like a, a, a metaphorical darkness when you're going through really hard times, the Spirit helps us in our time of weakness. It says when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. That's, I love that phrase. It's so poetic. But this idea that I don't know what to even ask for right now, God. And the Holy Spirit goes, I got you. I know your heart and I know the heart of God and I'm going to connect the dots. Let me just share your heart with God directly. With no middle man, I'm just going to share it. Verse 27, it says, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And then we get to some of the most well-known scripture in the Bible. When we get to verse 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and who have been called according to his purpose. This is just the intro to this series on hope. And for the next five or six weeks, we're going to look at specific teachings from the Bible about how to grow that hope inside of us. Each week will be kind of a topical thing, but we're going to do just like we did today. Dive into scripture and find how that's true. But as we, as we wrap up this idea, I want to hit up on one more verse in Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 20, 37. This is like the pinnacle of what hope looks like. Listen to this. Verse 37, he says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We've been through a lot together in seven years, Venture Church. A lot. Pain, suffering, joy, and celebration. The church has an even longer track record than our seven years. I mean, for over 2,000 years, God has stood in the gap for his, for his people. In fact, God's track record is even older than the church. It goes back to the moments of creation. And he promises, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I am always for you. I won't stand against you. No matter where I go, my God is there. No matter what I do, my God still loves me. No matter what happens to me, my God is for me. So let's rewrite this pandemic. Enough of the bad news. Let's bring the gospel, the good news, and spread pandemic hope and spike the curve. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this hope and just the thought that this is our seventh year. Lord, in scripture, seven is about completeness. It's about fullness. And uh, Lord, I hope that you're not done with us here. I don't think you are, but I do think that there's a good symbolic value of, of recognizing the fullness of your presence in the seven years we've celebrated as a church family. Lord, I pray for seven more, for 77 more. I pray that you'll continue to show us your faithfulness through thick and thin, thin. Uh, whether, we're putting, whether we're putting covers on skylights on a building or the, or the building's burning down or whether we're seeing people being restored from brokenness and addiction and pain. Lord, we, we thank you in the good times and the bad. And I pray right now that you'll cause hope to grow, to well up inside of us so that we can celebrate this hope with the world and that it will be infectious to the people that we come into contact with. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Man, pandemic hope. Spiking the curve in hope. That's just a crazy concept. I'm so glad Chris brought that to our minds today because in this time, I know I have felt hopeless. I have felt like there is nothing I could do to make anything 
better or show the light in dark places. But <laughs> True. I know that God does great things and big things. Mm -hmm. um, thanks again, Chris. Yeah. We're about to go into a time of uh, communion. Um, I'm going to ask my friend Jeff up here to come on the stage. Um, if you haven't yet, host, go ahead and grab your emblems. Um, and if you're not uh, cool with communion, if you don't do it, if it's just not your thing, just take a second, sit, uh, meditate on what Chris said. Think about what, uh, I, <laughs> think about what rising hope in everybody's life would do in your life and everybody else's life. It's just astounding. Jeff, it's good to have you on stage, bud. Hey man, thank you. All right, we're going thank to you. a time of communion. Where are we starting? First Corinthians 11. All right. We're going to break the bread. This is the time we're going to think about Christ, his body, his sacrifice for us. So let's read. On the night when he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break the bread. Mm -hmm. In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let's drink. So let's take some time to reflection right now and think about what we just talked about. We talk, think about what God's done for us, uh, Jesus' sacrifice, their love for us. Let's take some time for that now. Dear God, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for allowing Venture Church to be around Wilmington and to shine light in dark places for seven years. God, that is astounding. That is incredible. That's a small child's life right there that, that our church is right now. I pray that we continue to grow. We continue to, to spread hope in, in this time of confusion and chaos and panic and, and just mistruth, God. And it's time that we don't know uh, what people believe. We don't know what people are going to do. We know that you are constant. We know that you are love and that you want to shine your glory and your light through everybody. God, I thank you for that. Thank you for allowing us to come into your presence and to be with you. God, we love you so much. And I pray that we take this with us. We we spike the curve of hope in our lives and our, our friends' lives, our families' lives, God, that we would just take hope into the world and show it to everybody. God, we love you so much. We pray this all in your son's great and glorious name. Amen. 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 Well, that's the service this week. Yes. Awesome, man. Mm -hmm. awesome. We got some announcements. We got some announcements. Right. Uh, if you want a shirt, if you want a sticker from today and you're not at YMCA, Go to the website. Um, there's a resource tab, and there's a drop down for events. It's right there. Go do that. Mm -hmm. While you're there, if you have been giving offerings and tithes to Venture Church throughout this pandemic, thank you so much. It means a lot to us, and it helps us do good things, especially our COVID-19 fund. Mm -hmm. We've been able to do a lot of good work through that. Mm -hmm. I've been so, yeah, it's true. <laughs> so if you want to do that, go to our website, joinventure.com slash give. There's a drop down for both funds. It's, it's pretty cool. All right. We have one last big thing to yes. say. All right, All right. You ready? Here we go. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Venture! Seven uh, years, man. Seven years. Seven, seven. Seven. That's a good try. It's good. It it's works. good. But we have one more <laughs> thing to say. Yes. Now go shine light in dark places. <laughs> See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.